Greetings, everyone. Koku here. I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight as we start this paper. We're reading a paper from Dr. John Henry Clark called Slave Revolts in the Caribbean Islands. And uh, just to give you a little heads up about something, a little food for thought before we begin this reading. Two things. One thing you'll notice in history, if you study it close enough, uh, is uh, greetings to Lucas Ferreira. That's the brother from Brazil. Peace to you, Lucas, who's in the chat. Um, one of the things you'll notice when you study history, and you study war in particular, is the invader always has to give the narrative that the folks being invaded are lawless, are um, dehumanizing their people. Um, they have to give, you know, some story, right? And the story that's always given about African people, Black equals African people globally, is that we didn't have culture. And I'll tell you something, that still goes on today. There's people who walk around, in particular, people who will come and tell Africans in America that they don't have a culture. They do have a culture. You might not like it because you might not like the cultural output. But that, that rhetoric of folks not having a culture, that's the thing that's used to destroy people. And folks who are claiming to have a culture want to come in and impose their culture on you. That's something you'll notice. And if you go back to the time of slavery, the culture that the Europeans had was a warring culture, it was a culture of, uh, what's this thing called, the Catholic Church? Um, it was a culture of, um, damn, what's that called again? Where the Catholic Church was going around decimating groups back and forth and stuff like that. They had those kind of things, right? And then because our people didn't follow their shit, right? They justified that. Uh, it's called the Crusades. So after after they finished doing the Crusades in Europe, they then um, started to expand outwards. And they used culture as this thing to say, hey, we're going to dominate these people because they have no culture and to be, you know, they need to be brought up to a level where they could, you know, be around us and all this kind of stuff, but it's nonsense. So one of the things I want to say is, yo, stop telling folks that they don't have a culture because me personally, and I don't know about you guys, drop a one of you do too. When you hear someone telling you, you don't have a culture, you have to keep an eye on that person because what is it that they're trying to come and do? So we're going to read this paper tonight that should touch on these things. As Lucas Ferreira just said in the chat, hit the like button, please. Hit the like button. We have Ketter in the house saying peace family. The Learning Curve is here saying greetings. Bobby E. Wright is here saying Habari Ghani. Uh, Bobby e. Wright is saying Habari Ghani. Brother Koku and Bitter Medicine Podcast, right? So make sure you guys hit the button. The learning curve just hit a one. Yeah, you got to watch people when they talk about so and such doesn't have a culture. What are you trying to do? What you going to do, like the matron would say, right? So anyway, we're going to start the show now. On the other side, we're going to read this paper by Dr. John Henry Clark um, discussing slave revolts in the Caribbean islands. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. 
Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Just want to remind you guys before we get the show rolling that this show is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. The other shows on the network you are invited to tune into. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to The Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome back to The Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Tonight, we are reading a John Henry Clark paper called Slave Revolts in the Caribbean Islands. So I hope you guys enjoy my choice of reading tonight. Remember, my podcast is a re-Africanization podcast, right? The content here is to re-Africanize people. Uh, one of my personal missions is to um, have us create a uh, African-centered, in fact, a pan-African-centered uh, curriculum. This way, wherever we are, we get to learn more about our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who identify as Black equals African people. So uh, let's read this paper. There is no extensive assessment of the impact of Europeans and the slave trade on African culture. In order to rationalize the slave trade and the colonial system that followed it, European historians in most cases had to deny the existence of an African culture that could be compared in age and in influence with cultures in other parts of the world. Notice Clark talks about culture first. The tendency was not only to deny the Africans culture, but also to deny the logical adjunct to culture, the Africans humanity. Keep those points in mind. When people say you have no culture, that means you are not a part of humanity. In spite of this denial, the Africans did maintain some of their culture. This culture was essential to the success of a large number of slave revolts in the Caribbean islands and in Guyana. The slaves in this part of the Americas were generally bought in large numbers and kept together on one or two large plantations. Because these slaves came from the same general area in Africa, they had a related culture. Out of this culture, a communication system was developed that the slave masters could not understand. This event was played out against the background of the second rise of Europe and the beginning of the decline of the great states along the west coast of West Africa and in the Western Sudan. The European awakening that had started with the Crusades, that's what I was trying to talk about earlier, was by this time a movement to explore and exploit large areas of the world outside of Europe. So that tells you what the Crusades really was in Europe, right? Now they had to burst out of the confines of Europe and conquer the world. To continue, for the great states in West Africa, this was a time of tragedy and decline. Europe's era of, of exploration and internal strife in Africa were contributing factors to the start of the slave trade. This, in turn, was a contributing factor to the development of the philosophy of mercantilism that would dominate political and economic thought for the next 200 years. Early in the 15th century, Europe began to recover from the wounds of the Middle Ages and the Crusades. 
European skill in shipbuilding had improved and in search of a food supply for their hungry population and for new worlds to conquer, Europeans began to venture beyond their shores. There are many reasons why the Europeans had not embarked upon worldwide exploration before this time. Their ships were small and unsafe for long sea journeys. Oars were sometimes used to propel these ships, and the outcome of all voyages depended largely on the wind. There was no good maps or instruments to guide sailors through unknown waters. At that time, most Europeans were ignorant about the shape of the world, and some of them thought it was flat. The Portuguese set out to disprove this, and about the middle of the 15th century, they began trading with the people along the west coast of Africa, to which they gave the name Guinea, under, under the Sudanic Empire of Ghana. At first, they traded mainly in gold, but before long, they began to take slaves also. Um, social and political unrest began to develop among some of the nations of West Africa at the, same, at the time Europe was regaining its strength and a degree of unity. Let me read that again. I think that's an important point. Social and political unrest began to develop among some of the nations of West Africa at the time Europe was regaining its strength and degree of unity. The reason why I read that twice is because um, is because when there's disunity, there's opportunity. Put that on a t-shirt on the dog. When there's disunity, there's opportunity. And so all of the diaspora wars that's going on now, there's opportunity for our collective enemies to do something. When there's disunity, there's opportunity, right? Just keeping that in mind. Um, just keep that in mind, right? Let's continue. The first Europeans to visit the west coast of Africa did not have to fight their way in. Understand? Because why? Where there's disunity, there's opportunity. You could stroll in. The first Europeans to visit the west coast of Africa did not have to fight their way in. They came as guests and were treated as guests. Later, they decided to stay as conquerors and slave traders. In order to gain a position strong enough to attain these ambitions, they began to take sides in African family disputes, very often supplying the family or tribe they favored with arms and using their favorites as slave catchers. By the way, I think the African Union just suspended Israel's observation status in the African Union. Bravo. Let's go a step further and let's get them to the help out of there. Because why? They will come as guests and be treated as guests. Later, they'll decide to stay as conquerors and slave traders. Get them out of there. To continue, a number of African nations went into the slave trade in order to buy guns and other European manufactured items. Others were forced to capture slaves or become slaves. A point that a lot of people today don't get, right? Now, there was some lousiness here, but remember that a lot of Africans were dominated themselves. Where there's this unity, there's an opportunity. The Europeans did not come to Africa initially to find slaves. For years, they had been hearing stories about the great riches of Africa. At the Battle of Quetta against the Muslims in 1415, Prince Henry of Portugal, who later became known as Prince Henry the Navigator, heard about the prosperity of Timbuktu and the wealth of the great states along the west coast of Africa. He also heard stories about a great African 
Christian king named Presta John, another whole ass black equals African person. Before the end of the 15th century, Portuguese sailors had come to know the general shape of the continent of Africa. They traded regularly with African countries from 1471 onwards. Forts were built along the coast of West Africa. The most famous of these forts still exists is Elmina in what is now Ghana. This fort was started in 1482 by a Portuguese captain, Don Diego de Azambuja. Uh, because of the large profits gained by the, by the Portuguese in their trading in this country, they called it the Gold Coast. And I've talked to you guys about this before. I personally think, I personally think they should blow that shit up. People will say, well, Ghana, you know, they don't have much things for tourists to look at. Well, then they should have one less thing for tourists to look at. And that should have been the case. That should have been the case. Bibi Rodriguez is here saying, good evening, Coco, and chat. Good evening, Bibi. All right? Keto said true. I think he, he said true to when I said, where there's disunity, there's opportunity. And like Bibi Rodriguez likes to say, right, West Africa has some truth and reconciliation. West Africa has some truth and reconciliation to carry out. And one of those things, I feel, you blow that shit up. When I go to Ghana, I'm not trying to even walk through no goddamn. First of all, I'm too big to pass through, from what I understand, I'm too big to pass through the corridors. I ain't trying to relive that shit. The learning curve says we got a lot of ho-ass African people. I agree. I agree. I, 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 and, and when I say ho-ass African people, not just continentals. Bobby Wright says it was ridiculous entertaining the idea of Israeli membership in the AU observer or anything else. I agree with that too, absolutely. Does not I grew up with my grandfather and I'm saying something. History um history teaches knowledge. You mean to tell me y'all don't have enough history to have enough knowledge not to let these people in as a guest of any sort? The learning curve says peace to the chat. Y'all say what's up to the learning curve, right? Ketter says Israel have Africans in cages in the desert, but had an observer status in the AU. How cynical. It's ho-ass behavior. BB says, my pushback that they all became complicit orchestrators in the TAST, the Atlantic slave trade. Okay. 12 million ancestors. FYI, there are 172 remaining slave dungeons remaining throughout West Africa, 42 in Ghana. You see, that shit got to go. I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to. I'm not going to, to belay or belabor the point. I see Marcus McGee is here. Peace to Marcus McGee. He says, exactly. Cowards all throw the diaspora. Says, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of ho-ass Africans all over the place. Lucas Ferreira agrees with me. That shit got to go. Imagine you, your, your whole thing is for me to come, is for me to bring my black ass back there. And I can't even fit through um, the done from what I understand. And, and if you guys have have personal information, drop it in the chat. From what I understand, the corridors are narrow. They're short for like people five foot five or something to walk through. I'm a whole foot taller than that. And I got to pay my money to go through that and, and relive my ancestral horrors. Fuck all of that. Blow that shit up. And like I talked about on something recently, maybe Shoot the Breeze or something, it's time to get off of this tourism thing too.
Bobby Wright says, Coco, I haven't heard much from the AU about treatment of Africans in Israel, yet these ho ass Africans in the AU will have the audacity to invite these guys to observe what? We all the way out here in the West, we know about the Africans who were mistreated in, in Israel. And, and what's so crazy is, what's so crazy is, uh, uh, yeah, Afro Jam is correct. After I said it, I remembered Presser John was a fictional character. Thank you for that, Afro Jam. Yeah, and he is a fictional ho ass character, too. Right? Uh, but really, the person who's supposed to get our disdain is this brother, uh, Mansa Musa, out here flossing. I was saying something else. Oh, yeah, I was talking about the, the thing that's so dastardly about Israel is that the Africans that they're mistreating are Africans who consider themselves Jewish for the most part. They don't even give respect to the better Israel there. Lucas Ferreira says Ethiopian women were sterilized with Depot Provera by Israel government. Learning Curve says we are the new Africans. I'm just saying. It's us. Just us. And those that believe in us. Right? Yeah. But I, but I, but Afro, I, I, I want to stress what Afro Jam said is true. Presser John was a made-up character. Right, but he was that character was a made up African character used to um, used to get Europeans frenzied about what they could about what they could achieve in the continent. You know, to continue during the latter half of that century, European nationalism was reflected in the expansion of trade in both slaves and manufactured goods. The marriage of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand gave Europe the unity to drive out the Moors. Let me read that again. And, and this is stuff, you know, I, I learned this stuff in history class growing up back home because allegedly, you know, I'm from the country where Columbus first saw land. So we, we learned about the marriage of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand gave Europe the unity to drive out the Moors. Both Spain and Portugal were becoming powerful Mediterranean nations. In 1488, Bartholomew Diaz had sailed around the southern tip of Africa. About 10 years later, another Portuguese sailor, Vasco da Gama, sailed past the point reached by Diaz. With the help of an Arab pi uh, pilot, Vasco da Gama, reached India in 1498. For Europe, the door to the vast world of Asia was open. In order to understand the historical setting already referred to, it is necessary to look at least briefly at some of the main currents of history that led to it. The rationale for justifying the slave trade had already started in Europe with the Europeans attempting to justify the enslavement of other Europeans. This is something I, I talk about plenty over the years on this show. The European is a savage to the to other Europeans. What do you think? Meaning, meaning, the European has been a savage to people that looks like himself. What do you think he's going to be with people who look quite the opposite? who don't have the weaponry that he has. What do you think he's going to be? And yet, we still got folks on the content giving these folks observer status. Letting these folks in as, part, as quote unquote partners and all this kind of foolishness. To continue, this discord was a result of the religious wars that existed in Europe for hundreds of years. Inside most of the European countries, peace was unknown. Kings ruled like tyrants. 
The farmers were without land and had to work most of their lives on the farms of strong and rich landlords who had private armies to put down all unrest. Education was not available to the common people. Very few could read and speak up for their rights. People regarded as witches predicted the future and claimed to have magical powers. Children believed in fairies and were told cruel stories as a form of punishment. Go read the original Hansel and Gretel story for reference. All these dudes did was terrorize. All they did was terrorize each other. What do you think they're going to do around us? Now, the thing is, those Africans didn't know, as far as I know, they didn't know the terror that these guys were to each other. But those Africans should have known these are strangers. These people are opposite to us. Where do they come from? Now, you go back where you was. During the religious wars, many Roman Catholic kings would burn their Protestant subjects to death because they were not Catholic. Then Protestant kings would return the cruel compliment and burn their Roman Catholic subjects for not being Protestant. Europeans were skilled in all kinds of torture. These internal disputes within Europe were only partly settled when Europeans, using their new maritime skill, began to explore the broader world of Africa, Asia, and the Americas, North and South. The story of the African slave trade is essentially the story of the consequences of the second rise of Europe. In the years between the passing of the Roman Empire in the 8th century and the partial unification of Europe throughout the framework of the Catholic Church in the 15th, Europeans were engaged mainly in internal matters. With the opening of the New World and the expulsion of the Moors from Spain during the latter part of the 15th century, the Europeans started to expand beyond their homeland into the broader world. They were searching for new markets, new materials, new manpower, and new land to exploit. The African slave trade was created to accommodate this expansion. The basis for the European Industrial Revolution had already been established. They had already created embryo technology, including the gun. In the years that followed, they also used other advantages, mainly a large fleet of ships and rabble soldiers and sailors with no sentimental attachment to non-European people to take over most of the world. In so doing, they destroyed a large number of nations and civilizations that were older than any in Europe. The main problem with the African in dealing with the European during this early period was his tragic naivete. He had never dealt extensively with this kind of people. He came out of a society where nature was kind. Nature furnished him food, enough land, enough of the basic things he needed to live a pretty good life. These old African societies were governed by honor and obligation. Land could neither be bought nor sold. There were no fights over the ownership of land. The land belonged to everyone. That's not quite true. That's not quite true, because even if you go back, and I think I've read a paper on here before, you go back to Kemet, there's definitely um, there's definitely historical records showing that folks used to own land and uh, used to pass land down and stuff like that, All right? So that's not quite true. But I get his overall point, the squabbling over land wasn't really a thing. In the chat, um, in the chat, B.B. Rodriguez says, see, the West Africans were and have been working with all the nine Western European slave trade countries. Keter says, absolutely 100. I'm not sure what Keter is saying absolutely to. Um, B.B. Rodriguez says, the top tier Euro slave traders, Portugal, English, Spanish, French, Dutch. BB says uh, nativity. I think she means na uh, being naive. So shaking my head. Is that the convenient lie? They skunking. I'm not buying it. Uh, actually, I will. You don't have to buy it. That's fine. Everyone is entitled. 
I will say that I, because Africans weren't living in Europe. You know what I mean? Africans just weren't living in Europe because a lot of people are fooled by this Moors thing. But Africans you know, and largely weren't living in Europe, particularly West Africa, West and Central Africans weren't living in Europe like that. So they wouldn't have known how bad it was. You know what I mean? Um, so I got to give them, there was some naivety there. But what I will say is if, if you're naive about a group of people, if you don't know how they are, don't send your people with them. Keto says also their defeat of the Turks in Vienna with the Moors gone in Spain, the Ottoman Empire subdued at Vienna, the European was free to refine himself. That's absolutely true. You know, but but yeah, I I I I I will agree that I believe that there was some naivete going on there, but that is more reason for me to say, listen, if you don't know what these people are doing, don't work with them. Don't invite them in as guests. Do none of do none of it. Listen, we here today have enough sense to know. Some stranger walks up to our front door asking to come in. We know damn well to issue a threat and tell them, get the fuck up out of here. And not let them in. They should have had similar sense. To continue, the European coming from a society where nature was rather stingy and where he had to compete with his brother for his breakfast, his land, and his woman had acquired a competitive nature that the African could not deal with. In order to justify the destruction of these African societies, a monster that still haunts our lives was created. This monster was racism. The slave trade and the colonial system that followed out of parents of this catastrophe. The Europeans, mainly the Portuguese, who came to the west coast of Africa in this period, were not at first looking for slaves. The search for gold and other treasures lured them to Africa. They did not have to fight their way into the continent. They came as guests and were treated as guests. Then they grew strong, decided to be conquerors, and turned on their hopes. You see, that's the issue that I have. In the meantime, Portugal and Spain, having broken part of the Moorish power in the, Europe, in the Mediterranean, began to vie for spheres of influence. As good Catholic nations, they went to the Pope, I might, yep, to the Pope to settle a dispute. And the Pope told them, in essence, you take the East and you take the West. What's that called? The Papal Bull, right? Spain began to gravitate toward the West and Portugal towards the East using maps made by Jews. Now, this is where John Henry Clark, I imagine, got their ire, the small hats, right? Because he tells you plainly. And, and, and you know, what's, what's, what's wild? These guys will straight up say, well, you're being anti-Semitic, as if this didn't happen. These guys were the cartographers using maps made by Jews who dealt in gold in Northern and Western Africa. A Portuguese prince called Henry the Navigator, who incidentally never went to sea, <laughs> began to send Portuguese expeditions down the coast of West Africa, first for trade, then to establish Portuguese holdings in that area. Now, again, I have to blame Africans for that. These men came and built forts. Are y'all was cool with that? Come on, dog. Right? These guys came and built forts. And y'all just stood by? Uh, BB, I'm not going to go back and forth with you about this stuff. I'm. I agree with you. So nobody got on on a boat as an emissary to where your countrymen are headed to. I agree with that. No one went, uh, even before that. Even before that, um, I don't know how vicious West Africans are. 
frankly. I, and I know BB has a disdain for West Africans. That's on BB. I, I, I don't know how uh, vicious West Africans are, right? Because we're West African. I, I am from originally from West Africa. I don't know that I'm vicious or whatever. Uh, Bobby Rice says the Songhai Empire carried on a Saharan slave trade with the Arabs of North Africa. Yes, they did. Afro Jam says BB is a New Yorican troll. She spams everywhere. I've heard that said before, BB. I've heard that said before. Just saying. Uh, I want to thank all you guys for being here tonight. For a small channel like mine, this is a good turnout. I love the fact that you guys are, even BB, I love the fact that you guys are dropping comments and we can have a discussion while reading this paper. I appreciate all of you. To continue, when the Moors were expelled from Spain, they returned to Morocco, where the Emperor El Mansur arranged with them to invade Equatorial Africa, the old empire of Songhai. This invasion broke up the structure of the last great empire in Western Africa, and the chaos that followed set up Africa for the future European slave trade. The latter prospered, and Africans continued to be poured into the New World. Figures on the subject vary, but it has been established that during the years of the African slave trade, Africa lost from 60 to 100 million people. This was the greatest single crime ever committed against a people in world history. It was also the most tragic act of protracted genocide. The first Africans who came to the New World were not in bondage, contrary to popular belief. Africans participated in some of the early expeditions, mainly with Spanish explorers. The best known of these African explorers was Estavanico, sometimes known as Little Stephen, who accompanied the De Vaca expedition during six years of wandering from Florida to Mexico. The remarkable thing about Esta, Estevanico, who came to America in 1527, is that he was a remarkable linguist. He learned the language of the Indians in a matter of weeks. Because of his knowledge of herbs and medicines, he was accepted as a deity by some Indian tribes. In 19, in sorry, by the way, let me read that last sentence one more time. And you'll know why I'm reading it one more time. I, I, I won't even have to explain it. Because of his knowledge of herbs and medicines, he was accepted as a deity by some Indian tribes. I'll let you guys fill in the rest. In 1539, Estavanico set out from Mexico in a party with Fray Marcos de Niza in search of the fabulous seven cities of Cibola. When most of the expedition, including Fray Marcos, became ill, Estavanico went on alone and opened up what is now known as New Mexico and Arizona. The greatest destroyer of African culture and the greatest exploiter of the African was the plantation system of the New World. The African was transformed into something called a Negro. He was demeaned. This is the thing that is uniquely tragic about the African slave system. Of all the slave systems in the world, no other dehumanized the slave more than that started by the Europeans in the 15th century. Using the church as a rationale, they began to set up myths that nearly always read the African out of human history, beginning with the classification of the African as a lesser being. The Catholic Church's justification for slavery was that the African was being brought under the guidance of Christendom and that he would eventually receive his blessings. Two things about that paragraph. Um, I was looking at something the other day, and I wish I, I wish I kept it. But someone, and you guys might know, you guys might know, um, you guys might know, uh, I heard there was some conversations on Twitter recently that um, the word Negro, I mean, it, it's obvious that the word Negro delineates from something African anyway. And these 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 these, uh, these, these Europeans just picked up on it, right? It refers to Niger and 
all that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, the word Negro, you can say, some will say, is really an African term, uh, interestingly enough. Keter gets it. Uh, we was we was Indians. Okay. Um, uh, Caleb Don Seven says he sees BB as more of a contrarian. Um, uh, so forth and so on. So BB says, "What you think of me is none of business. I guess none of her business." I have the right to address the lack of integrity that the current and past West Africans in 500 years, they never demanded our return. Well, BB, as you know, demands are a power dynamic. You feel me? Demands are a power dynamic. Really and truly, West Africa wasn't up to speed to be able to come and make no demands. I mean, that's just... That's just facts. And, you know, just, just to deny that is just being, you know, whatever. Contrarian, perhaps. Uh, to continue, the greatest destroyer of African culture and the greatest exploit of the African with the plantation system of the new world. I read this already. That was down here somewhere. Sorry. There were several competing slave systems in the new world. In order to understand the effects of these various systems on the personality of the Africans, we have to look at each one individually. In Cuba and Haiti, the Africans were often a majority in the population. This is also true of certain portions of Brazil. Shout out to Lucas Ferreira. Therefore, the system operated differently in these areas, and although it was still slavery, the African had some cultural mobility. In South America and in the West Indies, the slave master did not outlaw the African drum. African ornamentations, African religion, or other things dear to the African, remembered from his former way of life. Um, this permitted a form of cultural continuity among the slaves in the West Indies, Cuba, and South America that did not exist in the United States. So some of this paper sounds familiar. In the Portuguese area, in the West Indies, and often in South America, the plantation owner would buy a shipload of half a, a shipload or half a shipload of slaves. These slaves usually came from the same areas in Africa, and they naturally spoke the same language and had the same basic culture. Families in the main were kept together. If a slave on an island was sold to a plantation owner at the other end of the island, he could still walk to see his relatives. This made for a form of cultural continuity among the slaves in South America, Cuba, and Haiti that later made their revolts more successful than revolts in the United States. It can be said that almost absolute, with almost absolute justification that these revolts and the personalities involved were the Caribbean antecedents of Marcus Garvey. It is against this historical background that he can best be understood. In an article, A Birth of Freedom, by, um, by the Guyanese writer Sidney King, Special Guyana Independence Issue, New World Magazine, May 1966. This point is graphically made when he reminds us that the Caribbean tradition, taken as a whole, is a revolutionary tradition. It is the stage on which acted Cujo and Kofi, Akabra and Accra, Toussaint, Kwamina and Damon, Ado and Arabi, all leaders of slave revolts. Blows delivered against the European system in 1750 or in 1850 served to shake that system, sometimes to its foundations, and to cause it to make democratic concessions as a price of recovery. It was never the same again, and although financial exploitation became more intense and complicated, a constitutional superstructure was raised for dealing with human anger and for sidetracking revolution into peaceful or inspiring chambers. That's a hell of a quote. The revolts referred to here were epitomized by the Burbese Revolution of 1763. This revolt, Sidney King observes, struck the first blow for Guyanese independence. It was a blow that the theoreticians of human subjugation will never forget. It was part and parcel of the Caribbean movement 
begun by the Caribs against European penetration and domination. While deploring the fact that this revolution has received scant treatment in the bulk of West Indian literature, Sidney King states that the purpose of his essay is to restore the Burbis revolution to its proper context. Let me make a note of this. Uh, not only in West Indian and Caribbean history, but in world history. He further maintains that it will be found that many of the initiatives for human freedom, credit for which has been claimed by the well-publicized and advertised revolutions, which were not without great merit, were in fact foreshadowed in Burbis. The essence of the Burbis slave rebellion and how it started is this. From time to time, the Africans not only escaped their cruel masters, but they killed them before doing so. These killings were spoken of as rebellions and scores of them were recorded. But the Burbis rebellion was more than a mere attempt to throw off the yoke of slavery, for it had in it the germ of a revolution. Cuffey, the leader of the rebellion, was a house slave who had been brought to the colony very young and because of his intelligence had been taught uh, coopering by his master. When the rebellion started in February 1763 at Plantation Magdalenburg on Kanje, Cuffey was there from the start, but he was angry at it. He had hoped to secure better conditions for the slaves without having to, without having to resort to war, but this was not to be. All right. So again, when we talk about African centered, pan African centered curriculum, right? These are the stories. And this is why I like John Henry Clark. These are the stories that he tells succinctly that we need to expand upon. Right? We need to expand upon these stories and we need to really analyze these um these rebellions. Ironically, while the slaves were rebelling, the governor of Burbis was putting a plea for them to the directors of the association. When he heard the, when he heard news of the rising, he did not hesitate to send what help he could to the planters on the Kanji. By the beginning of March, the rebellion had spread to the Burbis River, where the first plantations to be attacked were those of certain private planters who had been extremely cruel to their slaves. Plantation after plantation was overrun and the whites captured and killed. Meanwhile, the whites had rushed for all the places of safety. They took refuge in a brick house at Pierboom. They had turned the house into a virtual fortress, each window being defended and the approaches shrewn with broken glass. But this did not deter the Africans who bombarded the building with hobnails bounded round with burning cotton. Mm, okay. Soon the roof was afire, but is was quickly extinguished. But it was quickly extinguished. Uh, Kosala, the leader of the attack, told the whites that the Africans were determined to take the estate. The former held a hasty council. They knew that the governor of Burbis had planned sending a recently arrived slave ship to cover with guns their retreat to the river. But the ship was nowhere in sight and provisions and water were running out. The manager of one of the estates spoke to the Africans. He asked why they were treating the Christians in that manner. You, you, you see this whole ass stuff again that these Europeans pull? You see that? Oh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, why y'all treating us like this? Right? Why y'all treating us like this? I see in the chat, uh, there's some back and forth between Afro Jam and, and BB. I, I, I won't read all of that. Um, but I, I'll just read the one thing Afro Jam says. He says, why are you on a pan-Africanist page complaining about West Africans? Um, other than that, um, 
you know, you guys continue having your conversation. Uh, um, Kitter says, Keter says, I'm in the Caribbean, went to school here, and I never heard about Kofi in school. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Like, Afro Jam just said it. The Caribbean school system is based off of, uh, off of, um, off of, uh, you know, the Europeans, the colonial masters. Keta, what, what, if, if I remember, Keta, you're, you're like in like the French Caribbean or something, right? Right? I think Keta, if I remember correctly, I think Keta is in the French Caribbean. And so, yeah, you probably wouldn't hear about this stuff. Because remember how the colonizer kept things separate. They didn't talk about what the they didn't talk about what the British were doing, losses that they took, hits that they took, and vice versa. You know, Keto says to Afro Jam, "Yes, it's, it's a shame." You know, but this uh, this little story here, and this again, this is why I like JHC because he'll give you history in like a story format. You know that you you just have to like it. I mean, hit one of you guys appreciate the storytelling in this research paper from JHC, right? Let me see where I was. Uh, the manager of one of the estates spoke to the Africans. He asked why they were treating the Christians in that manner. He, he, you have to have some real audacity. And by the way, that's a whole move too. But you have to have some real audacity. You're allegedly a Christian enslaving people. And when the enslaved people rise up against it, oh, mercy me, why are you treating us so? <sighs> but again, the art of war is mostly deception. You understand? Why he out there shivering and asking why you're treating us so badly he's hoping for that backup ship to come and cover their escape you see kosala's reply was virtually a declaration of independence he said that the christians were too cruel and they had decided that they would not tolerate any more christians or whites in their country and further that they intended to be masters of verbus since all the plantations belonged to them when we had Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze, one of the things, and, and if you weren't there, you guys can check out Shoot the Breeze. I now know how to set up chapters. So each prompt is a chapter. If you check out the last Shoot the Breeze, you can jump around to each prompt, just so you know. But one of the things, Mr. Untouchable, who's usually on the panel, Mr. Untouchable put it this way, and I liked how he put this. He said, if black folks decided tomorrow, we ain't playing this European game no more. And I like that. I like that sentiment. I like how that's stated, right? These guys here, Kosala and them, they decided they ain't playing these white boys game no more. They ain't playing this Christian game no more. You guys are too cruel. Enough with this. We don't play in this game. This, we we going to take this country, this ours now. You know what I'm saying? And I like that. I do like that. Um, the learning curve pressed one. So she's enjoying it. Um, Mr. Oh, Keter is from, uh, oh, sorry, BB Rodriguez pressed one as well. Afro Jam pressed one. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to ignore your, your, um, your answer. Uh, Ketter says English. He says St. Lucia speaks Creole and English. I've been to St. Lucia. I had a piton, a couple of pitons well while I was there. Yeah, you know. So shout out to, to Ketter. Okay. Um, Bobby Rice says there were several rebellions of enslaved Africans led by African women like Brefu, leader of the uh, Kwamu Rebellion on St. John's. You, you know, I, I, I believe I talked about that on this show before too, in an old episode. So you could so, so you could check that out. Uh, Bobby Wright with more receipts. Maria in Curacao in 1716, and Carlotta Lukimi in Cuba in 1844. 
You know, I'm going to remember this. I'm going to put it on the screen. I want to remember this because if I can pull some research into those rebellions, I'd like to read those here too, right? So thank you for that. You guys can keep the info going. We had Lucas Ferreira here earlier. I hope he's still here. I know he was working out. But I wonder, being from Brazil, from South America, is Lucas aware of what happened in Guyana? Just curious. Um, Afro Jam says Christianity approves enslavement. Absolutely. You could read it in their book, right? The Learning Curve says they do not keep treaties and they only let us go. We must establish an entity that trades with them and defend our people. Absolutely. Keter says, cool, bro. He talking, he's, he's referring to um, that piton that I was talking about. I was drinking while I was down there before. Um, Keter also says one. Lucas is still here. He says, please repeat the question. The question I have is this story that we're hearing from John Henry Clark, JHC. Um, are you aware of this story? Being in South America, you know, a neighboring country like Guyana, um, are you aware of this story yourself? That's the question. All right. Um, sorry to interrupt your work out there. But, um, yeah, that was my question. Uh, you know what I, I want to do here? Because I want to remind everyone this is this show, the Bitter Medicine Podcast, is part of a podcast network. While we while we await um, Lucas's answer, well, he just said that they're not quite. While we await that answer, let me just remind you guys that this show is a part of a podcast network. There are other shows you guys should be checking out. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace family, this is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Have you ever considered joining KWAZ Radio? Each of our hosts shares their unique perspective with you. You might have a perspective that needs to be shared. If that's true, hit us up at kwaz.radio at gmail.com. What are you going to do? What you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, if you're interested in being a podcaster on KWAZ Radio, let us know. and We'll make it happen, man. Um, you guys are familiar with the content that we do here. So if you feel like you have a voice and you have a point of view that will work with what we do, uh, come through and join us. Uh, also, if I'm not mistaken, I think the matron had an episode earlier today. So make sure you guys tune in to the Matron's most recent episode. That's the Learning Curve po uh, podcast. Make sure you guys tune into that. Luca says, um, not quite. He says, black history is not told in schools. He said, in Brazil, uh, not, not taught at all. Uh, Bobby Rice says, Brefu, the leader of the Aquamu Rebellion, was very African warrior female. She personally killed her slave master, and his wife. Yeah, that's what I remember from that story. That's in St. John's, yeah. Um, in fact, um, if you go on the Bitter Medicine Discord, I'm pretty sure I put up under history, I think it was, I put up a post from Great House. That's X spots the mark on Twitter. 
good brother posts a lot of good information, man. He usually posts these threads. One of the threads was about breath food. I'm pretty sure. Uh, Lucas Ferreira says there is a law, but it is not as effective. Okay. Let's continue, shall we? Um, I just wanted to remind you guys of the podcast network. Let's get back into this nice story here. For a summary of the significance of the Burbis Rebellion and its place in world history, I go back to the article by Sidney King. He says the Burbis Slave Rebellion, as it is mistakenly called, was an episode in the 18th century of worldwide historic significance. To be of worldwide historic significance, an episode needs only to present new historical aspects that are at the same time qualitatively important. West Indian activities cannot afford to pay uh, obeisance to humanity, and so we are best fitted to redefine historical magnitude. Numbers, then, are not of first importance. It is sufficient that there is new historical precedent. A small number of human agents and a human drama can conceivably do something that has not taken place before, something astonishing to informed observers. This was the case in 1763. You know, I want to read those last few sentences again, because I think there's something in there that we all could take, uh, we all could take information from. And as I say that to Shout out to B.B. Rodriguez. I hope B.B. is still around taking in the show as well, regardless to what, right? Uh, But this thing says a small number of human agents in a human drama can conceivably do something that has not taken place before, something astonishing to informed observers. This was the case in 1763. A small number of human agents in a human drama. And I I like how that's said. Because what are we in? We're in a human drama. Right now, as African folks, we're in a tragedy. So when it comes to that notion that that I at one time even held, that, you know, we want these large numbers. And I, I still do want large numbers, but, but, at the same time, I understand that a small number of human agents in a human drama can conceivably do something that has not taken place before. And I hope that you guys who are listening, the small number of human agents here, I hope you guys will be willing and able to do something that has not taken place before. I want you all guys to think about that. And and as always, if you want to, we can continue these conversations even after the episode is done down in the comment section. Or if you want more privacy, join the Discord. The link is pinned to the top of the chat. It's also down in the description. Let's continue these conversations. A small number of us in this drama that we're in can do something that has not taken place before. Remember that. To continue, the rising of 1763 took place before the revolt of the American colonies in North America, known to history as the original type of colonial revolution and the forerunner of modern republicanism. It took place before the Haitian Revolution, which fulfilled some of the aims of Burbis. It happened 100 years before the Paris Commune, 150 years before the October Socialist Revolution in bourgeoisie Russia, and nearly 250 years before the launching of the Cuban Perpetual Revolution. It contains in embryo features of all these revolutions, and it foreshadowed as so many other risings have done. Some of Lenin's revolutionary principles. On the other hand, it came after the Jamaican Maroon and the Suriname Bush Negro movements, and aimed at carrying these to their logical conclusion. Let me read that again. On the other hand, it came after the Jamaican Maroon and the Suriname Bush Negro movements and aimed at carrying these to their logical conclusion. I think it was Afro Jam who was here before, who um, who, um, I think it was Afro Jam who had said it before that um, 
a lot of, well, let me not use the term a lot, but there were some sellout Negroes yeah, amongst, the, amongst the Jamaican Maroons. Um, and maybe that's a maybe that's a topic I'll discuss um, in the future, right? Um, BB is still here. She said, Cuckoo, I'm strong. No real trolls can run me. I come from producers and I produce. She says, I'm listening. Didn't know my neighbors had Burbis. Okay. Um, I think BB is from Brazil as well. Or oh, Colombia, sorry. I think BB is from Colombia. All right. But Afro Jam talked about that in the past, and maybe that's something to discuss in the future. The closeness in time of the Burbis rising to the Bush Negroes movement in Suriname and Jamaica, to the revolutions in Haiti and North America, reminds us that it took place in a period of world convulsions when the established order stood in jeopardy every hour, apparently to remain so eternally. The spirit of man after the refinement of the of, of the the spirit of man after the refinement of the Renaissance and the nationalism and heresy of the Reformation had been made extremely vigilant by the self-centered individualism of the bourgeoisie, rugged individuals. Now it was in quest of liberation. So it was too in the West Indies, a mainspring of the Industrial Revolution. So this brings us to the section that says, the war of the Maroons of Jamaica predated the Burbis Rebellion and is better known in history. The word Maroons once spread terror along the skirts of the Blue Mountains of Jamaica. There were times when they were swept down unsuspectedly upon the outlying European plantations, startled the assembly from its order, and according to an official statement of that day, endangered public credit, civil rights, and the prosperity, if not the very existence of the island colony. The Maroons have been compared to the European rebels called the Circassians. The difference is that while the white mountaineers numbered 400,000 and only defied the Tsar Nicholas of Russia, the black mountaineers numbered less than 2,000 and defied Cromwell of England. The Circassians, after years of revolt, were finally subdued. The Maroons, on the other hand, whose revolt started in 1655, were never completely conquered. The events that led to the Maroon Rebellion are only briefly outlined here. The African slaves in Jamaica under the leadership of a man named Cujo, who is better known in history as Captain Cujo, had withdrawn from a fortified citadel manned by the Europeans and had begun to harass the people in this fortress with spasmodic attacks. This first Maroon War came about because the English had begun to betray the promises previously made to the Maroons and were now encroaching on their territory. The English had made concessions to the Maroons as a reward for their alliance against the Spanish. Perhaps that's what Afro Jam was referring to, I'm not sure. In the protracted wars that followed, the Maroons distinguished themselves as a military power, but accepted a settlement that was less than independence. The settlement that is still being questioned by some Caribbean historians gave the Maroons internal autonomy while making them responsible directly to the governor of Jamaica. So I, I imagine this is what Afrojam was talking about. The Guyanan writer, Sidney King, appraises the effects of this settlement and the impact of the Maroons in this way. He says, the Maroons therefore seem to lack a total conception of liberty, which could rally all the oppressed in the island for an assault on the slaveholders' power. They were willing to buy a limited freedom by pledging in advance the liberty of their fellows. We can be excused for thinking of them at this level as a little aristocratic, as a material interest. Nevertheless, the Maroon movement was a mighty contribution to the West Indian and to world freedom, but it lacked the indispensable guarantee of national sovereignty. The Maroons were a people, a remarkable people, but not a nation. Mm. And they did not set up a state, right? So now I understand Afro Jam completely. Yet without them, Burbis could not have taken place. 
What is called the Bush Negro Movement of Suriname, or Dutch Guyana, was a closer relationship to the Maroon Movement than to the Burbis Rebellion of 1763. In their cause and in the way they executed their battle strategy by withdrawing from the European dominated plantations, they related directly to the Maroons. In fact, they were referred to as the Maroons of Suriname. Both of these movements used some of the same tactics, though the Suriname movement was not as effective. These movements were pre nationalist in their aims and scope. In general, they were freedom movements that given time would have developed into autonomous black states. So there's a lesson to be learned here. If it ain't about nation, it ain't about nothing. It's nice though, right? And just as I said, I, I turn back to the chat and Afro Jam says, you must have a nation to be free. You know what I mean? Let me go back up in the, um, in the chat. The learning curve says a lot of quote unquote free Negroes sold us out. We are not told that history. Absolutely. The matron goes on to say there is a small amount of nuance in why they sold us out. Yes, there is. Afro Jam says this is same thing in the USA. You must have a nation to be free. I agree with that 100%. Again, I appreciate all you guys being here tonight. We're almost done. Have no fear. In Suriname, some of the Africans who had been brought into the country at an earlier date had escaped into the wooded hinterlands and had established independent communities. These communities became havens for other Africans who escaped from the European controlled plantations. This situation, in part, helped to set the Suriname revolt in motion. The first open outbreak occurred in 1726 when the slaves on the plantations on the Siramika River revolted. After the government found it impossible to subdue these rebels, they tortured 11 captives, uh, captives to death, thinking that this would frighten the other rebels into submission. This act of cruelty only made the rebellion spread to other areas. It would continue for almost another generation. One of the leaders of the rebellion named Ado signed a peace treaty in 1749. In 1761, when the Suriname rebels were under the leadership of two black generals referred to as Captain Araby and Captain Baston, another treaty was signed. The plantation owners did not seem to have learned anything by their past experience. They did not feel called on they did not feel called on to honor any of the treaties that they had made with the blacks. Now, the matron talked about this in the chat just a little while ago. These people don't keep their treaties. So our people need to stop putting trust in their word. In 1722, another leader named Baron led the Suriname Maroons in another uprising. Some of the planters liberated their sla uh, slaves and used them against the rebels. Let me read that again. Some of the planters liberated their slaves and used them against the rebels. Here's a question I got for you guys. If you were on a plantation, <clears throat> liberated by your enslaver, in return for you to fight against the rebels. In the words of the matron, the learning curve, what are you going to do? And as we see next, <laughs> I mean, that's a telegraph play. This was only partly successful. The quote-unquote liberated slaves joined the rebels in increasing numbers. These wars lasted until 1831. So this war went from, from 17, before 1749, right? Right, 1726 to 1831. That's over 100 years. Why is it? We don't know about it like that. 
Why is it we don't know about it like that? These are, you know, we 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 know about the 200 years war, the 300 years war, 500 years war. These are these should be up there too. Why is it we don't know about it? Well, number one, if you expect your enemy to tell you about it, you're a fool. Number two, we're supposed to be teaching this ourselves. The revolt of the Maroons, both in Jamaica and in Suriname, helped to create the condition and attitude that made the Berbice revolt in Guyana possible. These revolts collectively helped to create the condition and attitude that went in the making of the most successful slave revolt in history, better known as the Haitian Revolution. This revolt was brought into being by three of the most arresting personalities in Caribbean history. Toussaint Louverture, uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and Henri Christophe. The distinguishing feature of this revolution lies in the fact that it achieved what the others were not able to achieve, nationness. Nationness. You see, that's the point of revolt. That's the point, point of any revolution. As Afro Jam said earlier, you must have a nation to be free, right? Um, the learning curve agree with Afro Jam. Afro Jam, I agree. You must have a nation state. She also says all other choices are subscriptions to slavery. Absolutely, I like that. Subscriptions to sub slavery. Uh, Bobby Rice says the Jamaican Maroons signed a treaty with the British that ended hostilities. The British would leave the Maroons alone and the Maroons returned runaway Africans. Yeah, that's not a good story. I'm going to keep it real with y'all. That's not a great story. At least that's not a great end to that story. Bibi Rodriguez says at the matron, you right. What you going to do? The learning curve, that's the matron, says our people need to stop selling out for some small Eurasian comfort. And I I, I, I wish that was the last um, comment for the night. I wish we were, we were at the end of the paper. So that's just it right there. What, I, what I'm learning about the Maroons, in a sense, is that they looked out for themselves. The dramatic beginning of the Haitian Revolution is told in the following extract taken from the book Great Negroes Past and Present by Russell L. Adams. Have you guys heard of this book, Great Negroes Past and Present? One of you did, two of you didn't. I'm just curious. In 1630, the French came to the island and took control of the western side of St. Dominique. With the sweat of the blacks, they made their territory the richest European colonial possession sending to France a steady stream of sugar, cotton, and indigo. By the end of the 17th century, some 20,000 Frenchmen, 50,000 mulattoes, and 2 million blacks lived there in an uneasy balance. Caste and class separated the three groups. Complicating these divisions was the presence of the Spanish rule on the eastern half of the island. High, well-nigh impassable mountains sliced St. Dominique in two parts. While France itself was a stare with talk of the rights of man and of freedom, equality, and fraternity, autocratic governors, uh, sorry, autocratic governor, governors general, I guess, held absolute sway over thousands of slaves who produced the wealth of Saint Dominique and over dissatisfied mulattoes who could own land but had no political or social standing. When the Bastille fell in 1789, the island trembled as though in anticipation of some dreaded catastrophe. In this same year, the mulattoes revolted. France then loosened its rule a bit and allowed the mulattoes to have seats in the new colonial assembly. But the enslavement of the blacks continued harsh and cruel as ever. As the revolution in France gained momentum, the faraway island of Saint Dominique became increasingly restless. The blacks became fired with the desire for freedom, and deep in the forest at night they gathered and plotted. The tom-tom language of the Africans told the, told the blacks of the planned uprising. So they're talking about the drums. 
the drum was used to communicate. On August 1st, 1789, in the late night hours, Bookman, a voodoo priest whose name and reputed deeds struck terror in the hearts of slaves, held a meeting of leaders. Among them was Pierre Dom Domingue Toussaint, known for his wisdom and respected for his learning. That night, the conspirators plotted their revolt. Eight days later, the entire 2,000 miles of French territory reverberated to the rhythm of hundreds of drums. The whites were terrified. With a mad sweep, the blacks moved from village to village, putting the torch to everything that, that would burn and killing every white encountered. For weeks, the sky glowed with the flames. More than 6,000 coffee plantations and 200 sugar refineries went up in smoke. The French rallied their forces and finally routed the slaves. Bookman, leader of the revolt, was captured at Cape Francois and his head was impaled on a pole to put fear in the hearts of the slaves. Toussaint succeeded Bookman as leader of the slaves and sought an honorable peace for the blacks who had taken refuge in the forest. At the same time, across the ocean, France had declared war on Spain and England. Thus, the French and Spanish halves of St. Dominique were at war, following the Arab dictum that he who is the enemy of my enemy is my friend, Toussaint collected his forces and joined the Spaniards to war against the French army. Very fortunate for Toussaint and them, very smart at the same time, too. Second in command to Toussaint was uh, Jacques Dessalines, a homely African, my God, who had been brought to the island as a young slave, but was virtually free because his master feared him. The Spaniards equipped the slave rebels and they began attacking the French from the northern and eastern portions of the island. Aided by the Spanish, Toussaint drove the French forces from the area. France spent three, sorry, France sent 3,000 soldiers to subdue Toussaint and his black Spartans, but they were soon overcome by the forces of Toussaint or the fever which spread throughout the island. Recognizing that it was helpless to control the revolt, France proclaimed an end to slavery. Toussaint was not satisfied with the proclamation. He abandoned his Spanish allies and fought his way through the French territory routing the enemy in town after town. His victories won for him the nickname of L'Overture, the opener, and the title of General of St. Dominique for life. All of the blacks praised him, and when he conquered, Captain Francois called him the Deliverer. It was here that he was joined by Henri Christophe, a slave who was born in Grenada in 1767. You see, that's the other thing, too. When folks talk about Pan-Africanism has never done anything, you're lying. Look at the movement of, of, of Africans throughout these regions, including North America. As a mere boy, Henri worked as a mason and later was bought by a Negro master who operated an inn where Christophe served as a waiter. In the army of Louverture, Henri used his native ability to promote himself to the rank of sergeant in short order. After conquering all the French territory, Toussaint established himself as governor general of Saint Dominique. Jacques Dessalines, his comrade in arms, was made governor of the province. Henri Christophe was promoted to the rank of general and made governor of Cap Francois. To the south of Cap Francois, there was a region that was predominantly inhabited by mulattoes. This region was ruled over by Alexander Sabez, Petion. Before Toussaint had time to pull the country together, the mulatto problem that had been somewhat latent during the revolution surfaced and added new problems to Toussaint Louverture's nation building efforts. The mulatto problem. We've talked about that on the show before, right? You know what it is. While Toussaint was turning his attention to the arts of peace and nation building, Emperor Napoleon, on the contrary, was planning the conquest of Haiti. To this effect, Napoleon spared nothing. He ordered 86 ships to be built to carry 22,000 fighting men. The commander of this navy was General Leclerc. 
This fleet arrived in the waters of St. Dominique in February 1802. The main force of the fleet was directed at Cap Francois, then under the governorship of Henri, of Henri Christophe, who refused to receive Leclerc. This led to an attack, led to an attack by the French forces. Christophe put a torch to the city, including his fabulous palace, and fled to the hills. Belatedly, the peasants rushed to join him. General Leclerc attempted to re-enslave the blacks and return and return all plantations to their former owners. When this tactic failed, he reversed his position and declared all blacks free forever. He offered Christophe and Dessalines generalships in the French army. He went through the motions of retiring the aged Toussaint with honor. This was part of an overall scheme to destroy the three main leaders of Haiti. Toussaint was captured and taken to France, where he died in prison in 1803. An attempt was made to assassinate Dessalines. This act of deception by Leclerc started another revolution. Christophe and Dessalines joined forces and drove the French army into the sea. In this crisis, the mulattoes put aside their loyalty to the French and fought with the blacks. Dessalines came to power after his assassination in 1806. Christophe literally rebuilt Haiti and ruled it until his death on October 8th, 1820. This is paper has been a story time, essentially, with John Henry Clark on slave revolts in the Caribbean islands. I hope you guys got something from it. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Let me read comments in the chat before I go. Um, B.B. Rodriguez says, Jamaican Maroon treaties are being trampled on as we speak. The PM is trying to steal their lands for expansion in bauxite mining, a.k.a. aluminum. Is that right? Yeah, J Jamaica's number one export is bauxite, and uh, which... I think Reynolds, I think the Reynolds company has exclusive rights to, if I'm not mistaken. I do believe when I was in school back home learning that Reynolds had exclusive rights to Jamaica's bauxite, because that's the main thing that makes aluminium. Um, B. Rodriguez says, one, yes, it's my rotating library. Oh, so you have that book. Okay. Oh, oh at least you've heard about that book. Okay. Uh, the Learning Curve said, this is why I'm so anti-rugged individualism. We can't win that way. And yes, I know this book. Afro Jam says, the African drum. Yeah, the tom-toms that he's referring to, that John Henry Clark referred to. Lucas Ferreira said, it was a ceremony for Ogun, the iron voodoo that ignites, that, that, that ignites the Haitian ceremony in Boyce Cayman. Lucas goes on to say Haitian fighters could fight even with yellow fever. The French couldn't. Okay, nice. Bobby Wright says to me, 150 plus years later in America, the slave master is still using his free slaves, the Democratic Party plantation slaves, to keep all the field Africans dumbed down and not thinking about nation. Absolutely. And it's such a shame. Bobby Wright also heard of the book I uh, mentioned. Keita says to Lucas Ferreira, you are right. Africans were immune from yellow fever and tuberculosis. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I know later on, but this was more so like in the 1900s, tuberculosis started to bother Africans though. Uh yeah, tuberculosis. But but uh, actually, you know what's funny? And I've told this before on the show. Um Car Caribbean folks were able to kind of heal that or cure that tuberculosis stuff. In fact, the American singer um Dion Warwick, if you're old enough to know who Dion Warwick is, she came down to my hometown to get cured of the of tuberculosis back in it. That's why she has that kind of raspy voice, too. Uh, at least I think that's why she has it. She came to get cured of tuberculosis. We always kind of 
we're able to deal with that stuff. Um, that's the paper. Hope you guys enjoyed this reading. Uh, give me a one if you enjoyed the paper. Uh, give me a give me a one if you enjoyed the paper and hope that I read more John Henry Clark papers on here. And uh, give me a three if you want to hear me do more research papers on different revolts in the Caribbean. I think there's something to be learned from all of this. Like there's something to be learned from the Maroons. You know what I mean? And so we could talk about that more in the future as we embark on this re-Africanization process. <clears throat> I'll be back again on Thursday. I'll be on the KWAZ radio side. I'm going to be talking about... What am I talking about again? I'm talking about... Um, What am I talking about? I completely forgot the title now. Um, I forgot the title now. <clears throat> I mentioned it during Shoot the Breeze, too, and I can't remember it now. But I, I, I'll be doing a, a, a show over there on Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join me. Even though I can't remember the topic right now, join me. Look out for the for the notifications that will tell you what the topic is. And um, I'll see you guys there, all right? You guys be good. Have a great night. See you on Thursday. Of course, shoot the breeze on Saturday. Post your topics on the Discord. I'll see you guys there. You guys be good. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine. <laughs>